Great, Akina. Carol Brazel, additional cause. Hello, all. I'm a citizen of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, uh, working at McGill University and in the Indigenous Initiatives Unit. And it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you today Ms. Geraldine Standup, who is a citizen of the Mohawk Nation from Ganawage, Quebec. As well, Geraldine is from the Bear Clan. Uh, she's a Dada, grandmother, a traditional healer, and the elder in residence at McGill University's First People's House. The words Geraldine will share with us now gives greetings and thanksgiving to all of our relations on Mother Earth and in all creation. Kichimi Gwech, Nyao and Geraldine. Gwechokwa, Sawada Hunsi, Oskar Negari Wasa, Nagadi, oh, the Gari Wadako, Gawano Hetsto. Oskar did a while when no near Guani Gura, the other day at Tino Verado, now Gwe Sua, Tony of Tuhak Nuguani Gura. Aguego has got it away, no in a guanigura, than a day at Tinoverado, na yukisota, Ohunza, Tony of Tuhak no guanigura. Aguego has got it away, no in a guanigura, than a day at Tinoverado, na gahnegarun, a Tony of Tuhak no guanigura. Aguego has got it away, no in a guanigura, than a day at Tinoverado, na gotsosua, a Tony of Tuhak no guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had no one in Gura, than a day at Tinoverado now owned that so a Tony of Duhak no Guani Gura. A Gregorska did the one who had no one in Guani Gura, than a day at Tinoverado now of that so a Tony of Duhak no Guani Gura. A Gregorska did the one who had no one in Guani Gura, than a day at Tinoverado now on of what so a Tony of Duhak no Guani Gura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, than a day to know where other than a guy of toast and a chonequa. A Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, than a day to know where other than a guy is so a Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, than a day to know where other than a good deal. A Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, than a day Tino Veraduna or Guiret Sua, a Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, than a day Tino Veraduna or Zita or Gua, a Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, than a day Tino Veraduna or Zinoa Sua, a Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregor Oscar de Dua who had known in a Guanigura, than a day at Tino Verado, na Yukiso Togo, Radiweras, a Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregor Oscar de Dua who had known in a Guanigura, than a day at Tino Verado, na Gaeri Nigawaraga, a Tony of Tuhak no Guanigura. A Gregor Oscar de Dua who had known in a Guanigura, than a day at the Tiruano Verado, na Squire Tiso. So, so what they are talking like a garaqua at twenty or two hack no guani gura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in the guani gura, Dano de Atino Herado, now you kiss sota as to talk a garaqua at twenty or two hack no guani gura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in the guani gura, Dano de Atino Herado, now you stock a runio. A Tony of Tuhak, no Guanigura. A Gregorska did the one who had known in a Guanigura, Dano dot sit the one who had a donor supply at this. A Tony of Tuhak, no Guanigura. On a guard there, what go? That's now what can I do you? The guard turn up to get any good, or is it in a this way out door that the Daniels are the ones to that out? A Tony of the Guanigura at all. Okay. Carol, would you like me to proceed with the land acknowledgement? Yes. So welcome everyone. Uh, McGill University is situated on the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Anishinaabe, more specifically the Kanye Kehaga Nation. 
As an indigenous person from Tibet, I acknowledge this and express my heartfelt gratitude for their caring and respectful stewardship of the land and waters over the centuries that allow us to still enjoy them today. Thank you. It is my great pleasure uh, to share this virtual international roundtable on the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as part of McGill's 10th Annual Indigenous Awareness Week. Let me first introduce myself. I am Yann Alard Tremblay, an assistant professor in political science here at McGill, where I teach also in the Indigenous Studies program. I am a member of the Huron Wendat First Nation. It is also my great pleasure to welcome our esteemed panelists, Eddie Kubilo, Claire Charters, June Lorenzo, Cheryl Lightfoot, and Romeo Saganash. We will proceed in this order, and Carol and I will introduce each of the speakers before their presentation. Each speaker will have about 10 minutes for their presentation, and we do hope to have some time for conversation between our panelists. And so I invite Carol to introduce Eddie. Um, question and my question again to the to you, Geraldine. So um, it's my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce you today, uh, Mr. Eddie Kubilo, who is an Aboriginal man with strong family links in both the urban and rural areas throughout the Northern Territory. He is he is a descendant of the Larikia, Wajigan, and Central Arenti peoples. Mr. Capillo is Associate Dean, Indigenous Programs at the University of Melbourne, Australia. So uh, Eddie obtained a Bachelor's of Laws degree and was admitted to the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory. Eddie is currently completing a PhD with the University of Technology of Sydney and is working uh, at the University of Melbourne's Law School as a senior fellow. So it was a little over five years ago that I had the opportunity of meeting Eddie in person when he was a fellow at the 2016 United Nations Office of the High Commissioners for Human Rights Indigenous Fellowship Program in Geneva. So we've been friends ever since. So miigwech for joining our round table, Eddie. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carol. Um, can I just acknowledge um, all the First Nations people here tonight? Um, and I'm just honored to be here and, and, and able to um, share with you all um, my experiences in Australia. And, and can I just say that I hope that um, all of you and your families are well in these crazy times, um, you know, currently in lockdown in Melbourne. So um, things are a little bit crazy here at the moment. Um, so I just wanna give an overview first of the Australian commitment to the um, uh, declaration. Um, Australia endorsed the declaration um, in 2009. Uh, since then in international forums, uh, Australia has committed to take actions to implement the declaration and uh, promote Indigenous people's uh, enjoyment of rights on an equal basis. Um, however, the Australian government has not um, taken in steps to uh, implement the um, declaration into law, policy or practice. Um, um, negotiated with uh, Indigenous peoples at a national plan to implement the um, declaration or have they audited existing laws, policies and practices for compliance with the um, declaration. So, in Australia, when new legislation is produced to uh, federal parliament in Australia, it must have a statement of compatibility with human rights um, and defined as the rights in the seven instruments that Australia has ratified. Um, this does not include reference to compliance with the, um, um, you know, United, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, so there isn't much that I, I know of regarding the, the um, declaration implementation in this country as basically not much is being done or has been done. Um, and this has been raised in the recent UPR process. Um, however, to give a bit of an overview, if we look to articles um, 25 and 32 around cultural heritage and land management, um, Australian land management and cultural heritage legislative and regulatory uh, regimes fail to recognize the uh, intrinsic connection between Indigenous lands and cultural heritage. Um, the current regimes do not uphold the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to free, prior, and informed consent. 
or capacity to reject mining and protect our cultural heritage, traditional lands and waters. Like one of the key failures is the loss of land in the destruction of, of our sacred sites by mining companies and governments. Um, look, for example, the uh, destruction of the globally significant 46,000 year old Dukan Gorge, um, which was described as the dawning of humanity, um, highlights the abject failure of Aboriginal culture, protection laws and native title in this country. Um, the, you know, the, the mining company um, blasted the sacred site in the Pilbara region of Western Australia in May 2020. And in this, doing this after having received ministerial consent um, to destroy um, through the uh, Western Australian Aboriginal Heritage Act. Um, so, you know, this site um, included um, human hairband dated at 4,000 years um, with a direct genetic links to the current traditional owners of that land and a kangaroo bone sharpened tool at 28,000 years. And basically that was the oldest bone used in Australia as a tool. Um, so the failure to protect this site confirms the discriminatory nature of legislation to preserve Aboriginal uh, cultural heritage sites and racially inferior land title um, provided to Aboriginal people. So looking now at um, overarching principles for articles um, one to six, um, basically the rights of Indigenous peoples to the full enjoyment of all human rights, non-discrimination, uh, self-determination and autonomy, and maintenance of Indigenous institutions and their rights to our nationality. Um, we, what we must understand is that our, Australia is the, is the only British colonialised country that never formed a tr treaty with its First Nations peoples when illegally taking our lands. Um, Australia was claimed on the Doctrine of Discovery uh, Terra Nullius, and you know, at the time, Captain Cook uh, was given specific instructions to get the consent of the natives, which you know hasn't happened to date yet. Um, so you would all know that that uh, terra nullius is a is a Latin term meaning land belonging to no one, and British colonisation and subsequent Australian land laws were you know established on the claim that Australia was terra nullius, justifying you know acquisition by by um, British occupation with, without treaty or payment. Um, so in, 90, in 1992, there was a, a momentous um, case called Marbo, uh, and it was a, no, number two, and it was, um, it, was a, it finally acknowledged the history of um, indigenous dispossession in Australia and, uh, and abolished the legal fiction of uh, terra nullius, but, um, it, but not giving back um, our sovereignty. So, so just, just a quick update then on the treaty landscape in Australia. Um, we're fairly um, in, in early stages of, of, of treaty discussions. Um, in Victoria, where I'm based at the moment, um, the Europe Justice Commission is um, getting started and the First People's Assembly and the state government are gearing up to uh, begin developing the treaty negotiation framework. Um, in the Northern Territory, where I'm from, there's a a new treaty commissioner will be announced soon. Um, there is a discussion paper out now with submissions due by the end of the month, I believe. Um, the treaty commissioner will, will report to the territory government about um, the steps going forward. Um, in Queensland, um, the path to treaty uh, consultations are ongoing. Um, the government has set aside 300 million for treaty. Um, it's not clear, but it looks like they will also set up a truth telling process um, following um, what Victoria is currently doing. Um, the Australian Capital Territory have committed funding um, in, in the budget to facilitate conversations with the Ngunnawal peoples around treaty. Um, Tasmania has uh, appointed former governor and dean of uh, Uni Tasmania to join uh, lead preliminary um, talks. Uh, and WA recently um, native title case called the Noongar Agreement is the most comprehensive um, native title agreement negotiated in Australian history. Um, the settlement involves around 30,000 Noongar peoples and, and covers approximately um, 200,000 square kilometres of the um, southwest region. Um, people are suggesting this is a treaty, however, it doesn't um, include all the other nations in that state. Um, um, I've only got about three minutes to go, and in and, and, and saying that, I, I, look, I wanted to um, highlight a 
are two things. One is the um, inequalities in um, that that Australia has. They've um, one they've um, suspended the Racial Discrimination Act on three occasions, and and in doing that, they've um, basically allowed the suspending of essential anti-discrimination laws in this country, and allowed laws and policies to discriminate against Aboriginal people who are Aboriginal because because they're Aboriginal. Um, and the, the other one I wanted to raise was some stuff around justice, and, and I'll just give you the stats and, and I'll leave it at that. So um, Indigenous Australians are one of the world's most incarcerated peoples. Um, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, Welfare in, in its 2020 report highlighted that young Indigenous Australians, 10 to 17, were 17 times more likely than non-Indigenous Australians to be in, in detention. Um, uh, the Australian Bureau of Stats advised that uh, Australians make up 3% of the total population, but we make up 29% of those um, in adult prisons. Um, and that's that's increased by 45% since 2008. Um, and and the, the removal of our children um, in, in a report recently uh, it say that it will triple by 2037 and our um, level of overrepresentation will increase out of home care for Indigenous Australians. Um, and, and if we look at our women, um, Indigenous women has increased 49% um, in, 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 in our prisons and um, compared to 6% of um, um, the increase for non-Indigenous women. Um, so, you know, the stats continually go on. Um, yeah, and, and in Australia, the minimum age of criminal responsibility is uh, 10 years old. And, um, you know, this means children aged 10 upwards can be charged with an offence in Australia. Um, and basically, I'll, I'll leave it at that, um, but, uh, you know, Without the implementation of the um, declaration, we, we, we have so much systemic racism going on in this country that um, there needs to be a real, um, you know, commitment by government to enforce the um, declaration. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Eddie. Um, we will now uh, proceed with uh, Claire Charters. Uh, Claire Charters is from uh, Ngati Wakaue, Tufaratoa, Ngapui, and Tainui. Claire is Aonuku Associate Professor, a Te Aparangi Royal Society Rutherford Discovery Fellow. Claire's primary area of research is in Indigenous peoples' rights and in international and constitutional law, often with a comparative focus. Claire is currently the director of the Aotearoa New Zealand Center for Indigenous Peoples and the Law. Kia ora koutou. Thanks so much uh, for having me and I too would like to um, acknowledge all the peoples um, in the territories where we all sit um, from around the globe. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Tamaki Makoto, also known as Auckland, um, New Zealand, and uh, our peoples here include uh, Tainui, Ngāti Whātua, and uh, many other peoples from the Te Tai Tōkoro uh, area, which is in the very north of, of Auckland and New Zealand. So, um, the first thing I, I guess I wanted to, to highlight when it comes to implementation of the declaration, because it's very relevant to us here in Aotearoa, is that we do not have a, a written constitution in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and we certainly don't have anything that is, is like a higher law, um, and certainly not anything that resembles um, higher law with respect to rights, be it human rights or any other kinds of rights. So it's quite an unusual constitutional situation here generally with respect to, to rights and not having them uh, rights being able to be enforced against the legislature. So generally that means that our parliament, um, which is controlled by our executive, um, is very powerful and uh, there's no formal uh, constraints on uh, both the legislature or the executive. Now, a lot of people will be thinking um, with respect to Aotearoa New Zealand about our uh, Te Te Waitangi, our Treaty of Waitangi, which was signed uh, between Nangatira, between chiefs and uh, the British Crown in 1840. So while it has a political force that's, that's um, quite powerful in many ways, um, it is also unenforceable um, unless it's been incorporated into legislation and in many cases has been breached um, and in many of the ways that also um, Eddie mentioned so with respect to land territories and resources uh, Māori rights 
to those to our lands, territories, and resources, and ongoing in, in ways that also Eddie mentioned, such as um, incarceration of our peoples, where we're up to 60% um, of our um, prison populations are made up of Māori, um, even higher in um, with respect to Māori women prisons, um, and uh, we make up of roughly 15% of the population. So there's ongoing breaches now to Te Reti or Waitangi, it's unenforceable. Equally, we don't have a written constitution and no human rights higher above our legislature or executive. So within that, where does the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People sit? Um, Obviously, as many of you well know, uh, New Zealand was one of the states that opposed the declaration, likewise uh, Canada and Australia, also the US, um, when it was originally um, adopted by the General Assembly, but changed its mind around 2010 because of political pressure, also because it could see its friends, the other states, um, coming to uh, support the declaration. Um, now, there's been different levels of up uptake across different institutions um, on the declaration. So, I guess somewhat surprisingly, um, the courts in Aotearoa and New Zealand have um, embraced the declaration to some extent. Certainly our highest courts, and that's um, like it is in many countries led by the personalities. So uh, we have had um, our Chief Justice, um, our former Chief Justice, uh, Sean Elias, who was uh, previously a strong advocate on Māori rights, um, was involved in some of the seminal cases, was proactive when she was Chief Justice in our highest court, um, in bringing the declaration into our uh, common law. And she did this in a number of ways by trying to interpret, it, interpret uh, law consistently with the declaration by referring it as to a factor. And uh, that was therefore followed um, by, by other courts to some extent, um, filtering down the lower courts, although really ma the main jurisprudence remains at that highest court level. So that's been quite positive. The, the one thing I would say about that is that the declaration um, hasn't determined the outcome um, of any particular case. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, is obvious as a matter of, um, of, of legal structure and our Western structures and that um, and in relationship with international law and that's that um, international law is not legally enforceable unless it's been incorporated into legislation but it has had this very strong um, role to play in terms of interpretation. Our legislature, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, has not embraced um, the declaration in ways that we might like. There has been pressure within the legislature to uh, support the declaration. And often you hear our members of parliament relying on the declaration when arguing for amendments to bills and so on. But there has been no reference to the declaration in uh, statutes or in any other way. And I, I highlight that in part because um, I know how different that is in the Canadian context, both in British Columbia and at the federal level. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. The executive, um, which does control the legislature, has, has historically and up until around 2016, 2017, ignored the declaration. Um, but due to pressure largely coming from uh, iwi organisations, such as so our um, tribal organisations, uh, due to that pressure, have started engaging with the declaration. Um, I don't think they came to the table particularly willingly, but I think they've seen it as a growing political issue and hence something that the executive should be thinking about. Um, so in 2018, um, our then Minister of Māori Development, Nanaya Mahuta, who is now our Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, announced that New Zealand would be developing a national plan of action to uh, realise the goals of the, the, the declaration. And then that was followed by quite a long process, which I'll just quickly go over just to update you with what's happening here in Aotearoa. So then in, in early 2019, we had um, a, a visit, a formal visit from the UN Expert Mechanism of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, invited by government and also tribal leaders to come and help advise New Zealand on how it might go about um, developing a plan of action, but also some ideas about what the substance of that plan of action might include. Uh, that then led to the establishment of an, of an expert uh, body made up of five um, individuals uh, chosen, chosen from Māoridom, including, um, I guess, some iwi leaders, academics, so I was on there, um, and uh, 
youth as well. And then we had four of the nine who were appointed uh, from governments and were officials from the various different ministries. So it was quite an interesting uh, kind of body. And we were tasked to come up with uh, some advice to the government about what a national plan of action could look like in substance and how you, the process you might go about to, to finalizing a national plan of action to realize the declaration. Um, the government uh, or the executive, the government, the ministers um, seem to be rather reluctant to push that forward. We, we uh, gave them our report in, in the 1st of November, 2019 and nothing was done up until um, March 2020. And then obviously COVID issues hit and uh, the excuse was, I guess, for at least eight months was that um, the government was um, dealing with COVID related issues and couldn't focus on this issue, although a number of other issues were progressed. Um, I have some sympathy for that, obviously, um, if you're a government trying to, to work out um, how to lead a nation forward um, in this unprecedented times. Um, but I think that there was, it was also motivated by um, a reluctance to really engage with the recommendations that we came up with an expert group. So that leads to the question is why? Um, and what we focused on uh, as an expert group was uh, tenoranga teratanga, also known as sovereignty or self-determination for indigenous people. So we're really focusing in on article three of the declaration. And that is difficult for Aotearoa New Zealand because we've got this English um, constitutional pedigree where all power resides in one place um, in parliament. So this idea of sharing power is, uh, really uh, foreign to New Zealand's constitutional structure. We don't have a federal structure. Um, all power resides in one place, a very unitary legal system. So this idea of sharing power was, is difficult and Article 3 is difficult for Aotearoa New Zealand. So that's why I think there was some political reluctance. As a, revolt, as a result of what we call um, official information requests, um, the, the Hia Puapua, the name of the report, was gradually released. And then um, by, I guess, uh, March, April this year, it came into the public domain and the opposition parties took great exception to it. And it became um, one of these issues that was a bit of a political football. The government looked flat footed on it because they hadn't owned it um, and hadn't addressed it. And then uh, the opposition talked about it as being um, divisive. Um, and all those other sorts of things that you're probably all familiar with in terms of political rhetoric, um, anti-Indigenous people's rights. So um, that did, if anything, however, galvanise the government into action. Um, and while they did try to distance themselves from the expert report focused on sovereignty, rangatiratanga, self-determination, um, they did um, accept the, the report and also took up its recommendations on what an engagement strategy might look like. So at the moment, um, there is a tripart, uh, tripartite um, uh, structure to uh, developing the engagement strategy and indeed the drafting of this national plan of action made up of our um, iwi chairs, our tribal chairs, um, ropu or group, uh, made up of the government, um, led by our Minister of Māori Development, who's uh, now Minister Jackson, and with the involvement of the Human Rights Commission. Now we are dealing with all sorts of um, issues, for example, what the, what the approach might be on self-determination and so on, um, and whether we negotiate, or negotiate's the wrong word, whether we engage first with Māori or then with the general public, and so on. So that process is, is a watch this space. Um, so I kind of want to finish there because that's where we're up to now and this, this sort of watch the space moment. Um, I do foresee some quite quick action. I think that by early next year, we will have some form of draft based on our engagement with Māori that we will then go out to public engagement on. So I think um, there will be quick movement also drawing on the work of the expert groups report, which tries to put some sort of flesh on what the declaration could look like in an Aotearoa New Zealand context. Um, the other thing I would say is that the declaration, given, going back to where I started, given our constitutional structure, we don't have a written constitution, no higher rights and so on, giving effect to the declaration in that context is quite different from places where, um, like in Canada, where you have your section 35, Australia, it's more similar to because you don't have rights that are higher and above uh, the legislature, but 
but implementing any kind of human rights is tricky in the Aotearoa situation, New Zealand situation, because of that kind of structural issue, which means that a lot of our um, dialogue around implementing the declaration is around constitutional transformation. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I look forward to questions and I look forward to the other, other presentations um, today. Again, um, Namahi nunui ki a koutou mā. Thanks so much for the, for the invitation um, and uh, I very much appreciate it and look forward to hearing from you all. Kia ora koutou. Oh, kichimi kuech, a big thank you to you. And so uh, now it's my honour and pleasure uh, to, as well to introduce to you June uh, Lorenzo, uh, Laguna Pueblo Navajo, uh, Dene in her language, who is an attorney and a consultant. Her practice has included serving as attorney for Native Nations, U.S. Senate, and U.S. House of Representative Committees, the U.S. Department of Justice, Voting Rights and Litigations, Inland Claims Litigation, and in Human Rights Advocacy for Indigenous Peoples before the United Nations and the Organization of American States. Currently, she serves as a judge at Zio Pueblo and practices law in tribal and state courts in New Mexico. She remains engaged in projects at, La at Laguna Pueblo, including advocacy on uranium legacy issues, protection of sacred sites, and protection of cultural patrimony. She holds a JD from Cornell Law School and a PhD in Justice Studies from Arizona State University. She is also the author of publications on human rights and indigenous peoples, protection for sacred landscapes and the impacts of uranium mining on Laguna and other indigenous peoples. So it was about 22 years ago, I had the chance to meet June in person at the indigenous women in, in front of the New Millennium International Gathering in Lima, Peru. So miigwech June for accepting to join our round table. Thank you, Goatse Hopa. Um, greetings, everyone from Laguna Pueblo, um, where I work and live. And wow, it's nice to see Romeo and Claire, people that I haven't seen in a long time. Wonderful to meet um, Cheryl, the new Emirate member by, uh, by Zoom or virtually. So hello, everyone. And um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this, wow, kind of an amazing group of uh, people. Um, so I'm going to say some words about uh, the United States um, implementation and what that might look like. And sometimes I get carried away, so I'm going to turn on this little timer. Um, so I think I'm going to start by saying, um, just to sort of go, um, take off from what Claire shared, um, as you know, we, you know, we have a federal form of government in the United States. And I'm going to start off by saying that um, well, the United States adopted very, very softly the UN Declaration, um, and um, they keep referring to it in official statements as an aspirational document, which drives many of us crazy. Um, but one thing um, that's happened that I want to highlight to begin is that um, monitoring bodies um, like CERD, um, like the HRC, have said um, when making their recommendations. Um, in particular, it was the, the review of the US compliance with the um, ICCPR, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as um, CERD. Um, bodies have said that because of the way the United States is um, organized that the UN, the standards contained in the declaration should be applied at all levels of government, not just nationally. And so um, I, that's been a signal and advocates all over the country, um, indigenous and other have really tried to remind and do education on the standards in the UN declaration. I think that's been an important reminder. Now, of course, um, during the last presidential term that wasn't even you know discussed but we're hoping that um, in this new administration that uh, there'll be more recognition and you know serious talk about applying the standards in the UN declaration um, many of you know that we have an indigenous um, secretary of the interior 
And our hope is that um, she'll, in the work that she does, because she she's responsible for a lot of indigenous lands, uh, especially that um, that she will her administration will be mindful, and that she would be an advocate in the current um, Biden administration to apply the standards. And so those are some things that you know people are scrambling to take advantage of now that we you know we have Biden and now we have. Deb Holland is Secretary of the Interior. Um, so in my work, the areas that I pay attention to because of my advocacy are is the whole area of mining and extractives. And um, there's a process by which the um, federal government reviews applications for leases. And I won't get into all the details, but uh, of course, free prior to informed consent is a concept that many advocates are pushing in various, all over the United States, um, in Chaco Canyon with, with regard to fracking, in the Grand Canyon, uranium mining, in my territory with regard to cleaning up uranium mines. I come from a uranium mine impacted community. Um, again, uh, there's proposal for uh, a nuclear waste facility in Southern New Mexico. So the whole uranium legacy area is something I pay attention to. Um, Another area is the area of um, tribal jurisdiction, you know, going to um, the, the um, articles regarding self-determination and self-governance. Um, and something that, that um, I remind myself not to take for granted is the fact that we have um, tribal courts in the United States. I realize that doesn't exist in many other countries. And so, the idea of, um, of, um, of getting more recognition of tribal court jurisdiction, self-determination expressed through tribal court jurisdiction is an area that I also pay attention to as a tribal judge. There is a recent case in Oklahoma that made the headlines. And um, if you pay attention, it was called the McGirt decision. And um, it basically gave um, tribal courts their um, recognize their jurisdiction um, over potentially non-native people over a large area. And I know that there are probably some non-native communities that are panicking uh, because of that. And, you know, there were early on people saying, oh, you know, we'll never get fair justice and so on. Um, but that's something I pay attention to as well, because uh, again, that's implementing um, many of the, the self-determination concepts in the UN Declaration. Um, I guess related to that is, um, you know, the whole, I, the whole area of environmental justice, water protectors, you all heard about Standing Rock. I, I wasn't very close to the litigation. Um, some of you may have paid more attention, but, but they clearly made free part informed consent arguments. They clearly made self-determination arguments. They clearly cited provisions. And so I believe that courts um, at all levels are beginning to see more and more arguments that incorporate the standards contained in the UN Declaration. And I think that's a very good thing. Um, let's see. And, and then there's a move that it's, it's an interesting um, and welcome, I think, move. And it's it started well, and it's very connected to Canada and, um, and the whole issue um, with the boarding schools, but um, it's, it's um, this whole, many of the major church denominations have begun this process of repudiating the doctrine of discovery. And many of them have challenged themselves um, not to just repudiate, but to take action because of course, many churches are on territories of indigenous peoples and many of them have lands that once belonged to indigenous people. So it's curious because that's going from the churches and it's going carrying over into the secular rounds to where um, many governments, local governments are beginning to do land recognition. Um, and as people become more educated on the whole history uh, on the doctrine of discovery and its legacy, you know, manifest destiny and all of this in the United States, um, I think more people, institutions are beginning to 
couple the legacy of the doctrine of discovery with the human rights and the standards contained in the UN Declaration and really begin to look at um, land and, and in some cases land reparations, but really begin to look at this seriously more than just saying, well, we repudiate the doctrine of discovery. So I'm watching that happen all over. I'm watching religious denominations push recognition um, and, the, and even some cases of giving back land or trying to partner with tribes to do that, um, recognizing um, the lands, territories, and resources um, standards. Um, I just, I think what I want to do with the few minutes that I have left, because I've lost track of time, is I don't want us to forget about the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, especially since we're in the Americas. It was um, negotiated over almost the same period of time as the UN Declaration. It was adopted by the OAS General Assembly in 2016. Um, many people think it's exactly the same as the UN Declaration, but actually it's not. Some people would argue that the language on treaties is a wee bit stronger than the language in the UN Declaration. It contains an article on protection for indigenous peoples and voluntary isolation, something that's not in the UN Declaration. Um, and, and I think really importantly is that because the inter-American system is one that monitors um, it and, and the inter-American court system, the Human Rights Commission, there's just a, a, a much larger, I would say, body of law on, um, and, and when the UN, when the OAS declaration was still being negotiated, even the Inter-American Commission quoted and cited the standards, even in the draft UN declaration, when it was still in draft form. So already the Inter-American system has been citing the UN declaration and now, you know, can cite the, the, the American declaration and it, it does apply to all of the Americas. And I, I think we need to remember that right now, the, the OAS has a plan of implementation. Um, of course, COVID has interrupted that as well, but indigenous advocates are working with um, the secretary general to come up with a serious plan of action to implement in better ways the, the OAS declaration, uh, and, you know, along with the UN declaration. Um, so I would, you know, I would say that Education has been huge by advocates because of the form of government we have, which is different from New Zealand. Um, many of us are pushing to have the declaration standards recognized at all levels. But so far, you know, the administration, they, they have not gone nearly as far as Canada has to implement legislation. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still pretty new in this administration, but we're hoping that We'll see more in one area that um, I would like to see finally um, is uh, the area of intellectual property. I work with other indigenous um, advocates in, in the World Intellectual Property Organization. There's a negotiation process on protection for um, traditional uh, knowledge um, and um, genetic resources and traditional cultural expressions. And, the US representatives have just absolutely ignored the UN declaration. So we're hoping to um, get more recognition by the administration all across the board. Um, and so uh, I think that's about where I'll stop and I look forward to discussion. Thanks. Tia Wang June. Now I will introduce uh, Cheryl Lightfoot. Uh, Shell Lightfoot is Anishinaabe, a citizen of the Lake Superior Band of Ojibwe. She is the North American representative to the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Canada Research Chair in Global Indigenous Rights and Politics, and Associate Prof Professor in Political Science, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and Indigenous Studies at UBC. She is also Senior Advisor to the President on Indigenous Affairs and is leading the implementation of the 2020 Indigenous Strategic Plan across UBC. As a member of the UN Expert Mechanism, Cheryl provides the Human Rights Council with expertise and advice on the rights of Indigenous peoples. 
The mechanism also assists member states in achieving the goals of the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples. She is the first indigenous woman from Canada to be appointed to this prestigious position. Uh, Cheryl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, for that introduction. Um, and um, I want to just express appreciation to all the speakers uh, that have gone ahead of me. It's wonderful to hear from all corners of our world. Um, and I'm happy to join you today from the University of British Columbia, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkamenum speaking Musqueam people. And in my uh, about 10 minutes with you today, I hope to give um, what is an all too brief high level overview of implementation efforts, both within Canada, but especially globally, given um, my new position on the MRIP. And um, the, the global view is that the UN Declaration remains one of the most challenging human rights instruments to actually implement. Um, and even though it now enjoys uh, universal or mostly universal rhetorical support, the actual implementation is a, a huge slog, uh, no matter what part of the world we're talking about. Um, but let's not focus on the bad because all the news is not bad. As a global community, we can witness uh, extensive and um, very hopefully expanding application of the UN Declaration internationally, regionally, and in many cases domestically. So in a, a very brief high level overview, we wanna to touch on uh, four main forms that implementation efforts of the UN Declaration can take. So we can look at the, through the UN system, we can look at regionally, as Claire mentioned, uh, legal cases, legal actions, court cases on both a national and in some cases, subnational level. And then there is a huge area of constitutional legislative and policy change, which can be activated anywhere from the national to the local, municipal, even corporate and NGO or institutional or even university levels. Um, so, First of all, um, the UN system on, on the global scale. We have significant progress to report actually since 2007 in the past 14 years. The UN declaration has been in many respects mainstreamed throughout the UN system for at least a decade now, meaning that it is being used routinely to set guidelines and standards throughout the UN system. And what this translates to is that organizations and specialized agencies of the UN are now uh, required to contribute to its realization in their own work. So what this translates to, uh, particularly in the developing world, is significant impact because agencies like the World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, UN Development Program are required to rely on the guidelines and standards of the UN Declaration in their work on the ground. Then, of course, there are also the three targeted UN mechanisms of the United Nations, which each have specific roles and all work towards the advancement of the UN Declaration. So here we have the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which meets annually in New York, at least in normal times, um, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the body that I currently serve on, the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And all of these mechanisms mechanisms serve from their own realms to advance the implementation of the UN Declaration. And importantly, many of us have noticed that in recent years, uh, UN treaty bodies like the CERD, the Committee, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, are increasingly, and in some cases exponentially increasing and integrating their citation and use of the UN Declaration into their ordinary country review and remedy processes. So this is all um, 
encouraging and significant news. Secondly, there's the regional level. And um, here I'm gonna piggyback a little bit on what June was speaking about. We've seen some significant implementation progress since 2007 regionally. Um, like June mentioned, the Organization of American States, the OAS has passed its own Indigenous Rights Declaration, which reinforces and, as she highlighted, advances uh, on the UN Declaration in the Western Hemisphere. But it's not just the Western Hemisphere. We also have um, other regional organizations like the African Commission and the African Court that have significantly integrated the UN Declaration into their work and their rulings. Thirdly is the legal sphere, um, and this is ever evolving. Various national courts, Supreme Courts around the world are citing and integrating the UN Declaration into court decisions. And the list here is growing each year. So we have countries that have had legal cases citing the Declaration as early on as Belize in 2007, Botswana, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Kenya, Mexico, Russia, and also New Zealand, as, as Claire mentioned. Here in Canada, my research team at UBC has identified almost 200 court cases, all at the federal level that cite the UN Declaration or integrate it in some way into the ruling. Uh, the vast majority of these are occurring at the district court level, the federal district court level, and a handful are making their way into the federal appeals court. There's not yet a major Supreme Court case that directly cites the declaration, but I think with all of this momentum, it's just a matter of time. And I think that is the direction that things are headed. And then fourth and finally is the vast and all important realm of constitutional, legislative and policy measures. And here we see significant movement forward in a number of realms, but again, um, progress is uneven. Um, so beginning in 2007, Bolivia was the first country to adopt the UN Declaration into national legislation. And then two years later in its constitution, it became one of the most comprehensive instruments for recognizing indigenous people's rights. But Politics being politics, there are often some, some pullbacks um, and in some of these advancements, and we have seen that um, in, in the past number of years in Bolivia. Um, 2008, Ecuadorian constitution established a plurinational state and recognized collective rights of indigenous peoples in many respects. Um, Number of countries across Africa and Asia have implemented certain pieces of national legislation and policies not to integrate or support the UN Declaration in its entirety, but to support particular rights that are articulated in the UN Declaration on a more piecemeal basis. So here we've seen advancements in the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Morocco, and Namibia, to name a few. And then we've had other policy advancements in countries like Cambodia, Japan, Philippines, Thailand, and Bangladesh. Here in British Columbia, where I currently live and work, the provincial government passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act in November 2019. And in doing so became the first jurisdiction in uh, the Anglo uh, colonial world to, to do so. And this piece of provincial legislation which was co-developed with the First Nations Leadership Council here in the province, set out a process to align British Columbia's laws with the UN Declaration. And it did this in a couple of ways. So first of all, it mandated that the provincial government bring its laws into harmony with the UN Declaration over time, beginning with a widespread review of existing law and policy. And it then required an action plan on the provincial level to achieve that alignment over time. And where we are at currently is the draft action plan that has been produced uh, is currently at the end stage of its consultation phase with indigenous peoples in the province. And we will uh, see further action from there. And then it also requires an annual report uh, to the provincial legislature 
on progress. Um, the first report was released very quickly after the legislation was adopted in summer of 2020. And then fourth, um, it provides a framework for joint decision making between Indigenous uh, governing bodies and the province on issues of um, concern to both. And then earlier this year, Canada passed very similar legislation on the federal level, which my colleague Romeo will speak to you about. So the UN Declaration is increasingly finding its way into um, law and policy. Now, before we get too celebratory, um, I just have to close with the thought that uh, there is nowhere on earth yet where Indigenous human rights and the UN Declaration are actually fully implemented. And so I need to say that there is yet no best practices example on the world around the world. The best we can do is pull good practices uh, from country to country and those vary significantly. Um, and what we often see is some countries shine in one sphere while lagging in another and then uh, switch places um, on another issue. So I'll stop there um, and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to join this very prestigious panel. Uh, Tia Wang Shiril. Uh, we'll now have uh, Romeo Saganash. Um, Mr. Romeo Saganash was the member of parliament for ABTB Bay James Nunavik AU from 2011 to 2019. Romeo's story is not a typical story. Values from the AU Cree, a childhood spent in the forest of northern Quebec, a survivor of residential school, hard work, and education to become the first Indigenous lawyer from the Université du Québec à Montréal Law School, and a lifetime working to uphold human rights. His accomplishments are many. He was one of the principal authors of La Paix des Braves, a landmark agreement between the James Bay Cree and the government of Quebec. And he has been a key negotiator for many national and international initiatives, including the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Romeo, the floor is yours. Merci, Anne. Uh, it's been a long time uh, um, so i just i just want to start by saying uh, talking a bit about the the un declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples it's been um, it's been a, a long road for many of us uh, as we all know uh, we've discussed uh, negotiated this declaration for over um, uh, two decades um, any of us, and uh, it's been almost two decades since it was adopted by the UN Gen General Assembly uh, in New York in 2007. So it's uh, it's been a long road for all of us. Uh, very few people know that the UN Declaration has been the longest discussed and negotiated universal human rights instrument uh, in the history of the UN, as a matter of fact. So this is important to remember. Uh, the issues that we had to deal with in Geneva every summer were difficult uh, and uh, difficult to uh, negotiate and get accepted by, by nation states. Uh, I think all of us also realized that uh, the UN declaration has been reaffirmed by, by the UN General Assembly at least 10 times since its adoption in, uh, in 2007 by the General Assembly. Reaffirmed by consensus means that no vote, means that no state in the world opposes formally the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In fact, let me read you what the UN General Assembly highlighted last December. Uh, um, 
regarding the declaration. The UN General Assembly said that the declaration, and I quote, has positively influenced the drafting of several constitutions and statutes at the national and local levels and contributed to, pro to the progressive development of international and national legal frameworks and policies. Um, so it's true. And uh, we've seen that development uh, here nationally in Canada with uh, the adoption of uh, uh, Bill C-15, uh, essentially copied on my private member's bill when, I'm, when I was member of parliament, uh, Bill C-262. I think it, in some ways it even go, goes further. In its preamble, for instance, C-15 uh, unequivocally repudiates colonialism, uh, as well as the doctrines of superiority. Uh, as we know in international law, those includes the doc doctrines of discovery and terra nullius. And that's important. Uh, many people don't really uh, integrate in their interpretation of laws uh, the importance of preambular paragraphs that help interpret uh, uh, operative uh, provisions of legislation. Um, C-15 also affirms that Indigenous peoples' inherent and pre-existing legal systems are recognized. It safeguards treaty rights, of course, of Indigenous peoples, and it highlights implementation of the Declaration can contribute to responding to the growing concern regarding the, our climate cri crisis right now. That is an important statement. That is an important uh, issue uh, as we speak. And uh, I think uh, uh, in a way, Bill C-15 goes way beyond what I have uh, proposed as a member of parliament with Bill C-262. I think that uh, as I listen to um, our panelists today, uh, Bill C-15 will set an international precedent in terms of uh, uh, the importance of the declaration. The po positive benefits uh, will not be limited to uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada, but will serve to provide a positive example for states in different parts of the world. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing that I've argued over, over the last few years about the declaration is that in the Canadian legal tradition, inter international human rights standards have real weight in domestic law. Canadian courts and tribunals take Canada's commitments uh, seriously and regularly use international human rights um, norms to interpret and apply domestic law in this country. This is what C-15 means and explicitly states when it affirms that the UN Declaration, and I quote, as a universal international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law. This bill will not turn the declaration into Canadian law. This is about acknowledging the reality that the de declaration is already part of Canada's uh, legal landscape. So in my eight and a half years as a legislator in the other place, uh, the the uh, Parliament of Canada, I've had to review and consider some 1,460 plus pieces, pieces of legislation. Uh, some were lengthy, some others were very short, and some are pretty innocuous, were pretty innocuous. C-15 falls in that latter category. One simply 
needs to refer to uh, first to the purposes of the act. And uh, I have the act in front of me right here, uh, Article 4A and B. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, the purposes of the act is the title of 4A and 4B. A, to affirm that the declaration as a universal international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law. B, provide a framework for the government of Canada's implementation of the declaration. I think the other important part of the seven uh, article, seven articles of this uh, Bill C-15 adopted by Parliament is Article 5, where the government of Canada uh, must, according to the words of this bill, must in cons consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, take all measures to ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration. That, that has an important uh, dimension in my view. Um, if you consider the, uh, the laws of Canada right now with respect to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, for instance, Article 4.1 of uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada uh, declares that the minister, uh, Article 4.1 of the Department of Justice Act declares that the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General must make sure that any legislation before it is introduced in Parliament must be consistent and compatible with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We did not have the equivalent for Indigenous rights uh, before C-15. So C-15 with Article 5, making sure that any legislation is compatible and consistent with the UN Declaration is a big step forward uh, uh, in terms of recognizing that we respect uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights in this country and human rights. Uh, we've We've had a very difficult time uh, in this country uh, and in, in, in everywhere, as a matter of fact, to recognize that um, Indigenous rights are human rights. We came close uh, with the Chilcotin case in, in uh, 2014, I believe, where the Supreme Court said that the uh, part one which deals with the Charter Rights and part two, Aboriginal rights in the Canadian constitution of 1982, our sister provisions would serve, would serve, serve to limit um, uh, the powers of governments, both provincial and federal in our political system in Canada. So it's, uh, it's been a long road. I know my time is, is coming to an end, but, uh, uh, we talked about com compliance, consistency, uh, higher law, Claire mentioned that. Um, I think we need to talk about Indigenous law in that whole perspective as well. The American Declaration, which is important. Uh, I think the principle under international law uh, recognizes that uh, in, in, in determining rights under declarations, um, we need to take into, into consideration the stronger provisions of, the, uh, of declarations, uh, including between the UN Declaration and the American Declaration. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm looking forward to at least debate, uh, debating um, what the concept of co-developing legislation means in our context in Canada because uh, uh, there are issues with, with that as well uh, in, in this country. But uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for this uh, uh, kind invitation to speak at this panel.
prestigious panel, uh, and uh, I'm prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Tia Wenk, Romeo. Um, and although we are over time, uh, since this is a round table, I think it would be appropriate if we took another 10 minutes as uh, we discussed together uh, with the panelists earlier um, to have a free discussion between the panelists. Um, the only thing I would ask our panelists is to keep uh, their intervention short considering the limited amount of time we have. Uh, I would ask you to uh, turn on your camera and to uh, not use the chat if you want to speak, but to raise your hand and I will um, manage the conversation this way. Uh, and after this, uh, we uh, will invite Elder Geraldine to close the event. Uh, yes, Cheryl. Thank you, Jan. I have a follow-up question for Claire, actually. Um, and uh, here in Canada, we've had a very close connection between our inquiries, uh, the TRC, the Missing, Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiries, and explicit ties to the UN Declaration. Um, and I'm aware that you are undergoing um, an inquiry of your own uh, in Altero, New Zealand. Have there been any connections made or do you anticipate any of the connections being made um, in your context? Kia ora Cheryl, thanks so much for that. Um, so as you mentioned, we've got um, a Royal Commission uh, into abuse and care. Uh, so be that state-based or faith-based care. Um, and the important thing to note about that process is that it covers it's not focused specifically on Māori. Um, it is a national-wide um, looking um, commission into abuse and care. Clearly, well, not clearly, um, but unfortunately, Māori were heavily disproportionately impacted um, by abuse and care, be it faith-based or state-based. Um, so that is a key element or key question or key issue within the Royal Commission's work. How that plays out though uh, is more focused in on Te Tiriti or Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, rather than the declaration per se. I think um, the declaration will be part of the wider framework, but most of, mostly to reinforce um, the rights in Te Tiriti or Waitangi. As you know very well, Cheryl, that the treaty does play sort of a larger role in the national political and legal consciousness compared to, to the declaration. Um, from where I sit watching the, the commission, um, which is quite close to it, my husband's one of the commissioners. Um, I think that there is a real tension between this national focus on generally abuse and care versus the specific issues that Māori face. So there is a tension between trying to ensure that the commission takes a indigenous centric um, approach to uh, abuse of Māori and generally um, versus just it is a problem of abuse that, that might have impacted Māori disproportionately, but it's really just about abuse nationally. So there is that tension there and the declaration could be some use alongside Te Tiriti in that. Um, thanks for the, the um, question, Cheryl. I also have a question, um, but I'll wait till it's my turn. Well, there's no one else on the speaking list, so you can go. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody for your comments. It is wonderful to see you all um, here. I, I miss you all um, a lot. Um, so uh, my question is really for, for Eddie, but I'd be interested in other comments um, around this. And Eddie, I've been so interested in watching um, also the developments at a, at a national level with the is it Voice to Parliament movement. Um, and my understanding is at least that the declaration has heavily influenced some of that debate or at least that, that movement in ways that might not be captured formally. And so, and I, and I wonder to what extent also the declaration with various state 
developments, particularly around treaty negotiations. What is the kind of role of the declaration that you might not see in, a, in, a, in official records or um, in written down in the in the framework agreements or in, in that kind of thing? So, yeah, I'm just trying to capture what the role of the declaration is. I want to say peripherally, but that's not what I mean, but kind of politically in, in that debate. Well, thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, look, there's a lot going on at the moment. There's, there's two, there's two um, vehicles going on at the moment in Australia. One is the um, voice to parliament um, and the other is, is the treaty, um, you know, mechanism, which um, a states, are, states themselves are driving those, you know, under federalism, our system. And um, the, the Commonwealth is um, a little bit holding off on that. I mean, they're doing um, deliberations in the background. They've, they've recently had a review um, and recommendations given. Um, I, I haven't seen the um, report, um, so I'm not sure if it's it's public yet. But um, so you know that that's been driven by a hand-picked um, indigenous group, um, and also there's a um, an indigenous led um, from. Um, indigenous peoples in regards to the voice itself they have um you know obviously um megan davis who's um heavily involved with the um, un mechanisms and um she heavily drives that and and obviously her logic and thinking is is pushing those um key responsibilities to government's um roles in regards to them um you know endorsing those those treaty treaties that they've, they've assigned to um, and, and look, the states are currently in Australia leading the way, and, and I'd assume that a majority of that logic is under the utilisation of the UNDRIP um, and, and giving enforcement into in, in the ways that um, they're going ahead. Um, Victoria, where I, where I reside at the minute, is probably the, you know, the one that's um, leading the way. Um, and then the rest are, are, are in, now they're all really in the infancy in regards to, like, if we look to, your, to New Zealand and, and Canada, but um, you know, th there's a lot of um, talk and, and discussion amongst Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people now. So there's that, that's that's a positive at all. I think that there's this um, ongoing dialogue between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, Australia, unfortunately, politics plays a heavy role in in, um, in Indigenous rights in this country, um, and we like to. Um, Heavily litigate indigenous rights, so um, you know. So we're, we're we're really trying to find a balance there, where we discuss more about mediation and discussions at this present time. But personally, I think that um, you know, indigenous people are voicing their their opinions on 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 these things, and the UNDRIP has been a um, you know something that they they look to. Um, um, our governments federal governments of all persuasions haven't really been um, supportive of, of implementing in their days, um, as I mentioned in, in my discussion. And, you know, again, it's, it's, it's we're at the sta early stages and, and things are, are, are really moving on. Uh, you know, there's issues around criminal responsibility, you know, eight kids, um, child removal, um, and, and again, with um, heritage, all these things um, which could be really um, reinforced through the declaration are, are really are not being um, utilised at this stage. So, um, so there are positives and, and negatives as, um, you know, Cheryl pointed out, but I, I think at the minute it's, it's, it's a really standoff at this stage in regards to really um, forging ahead, although, as I said, the states have, have really um, led the way in, in our negotiations with Indigenous nations in regards to treaty. Thank you, Eddie. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, Romeo. Uh, have to unmute yourself. The famous phrase in the pandemic context, unmute yourself. 
Oh, well, um, I'd like to ask Claire, and Claire, it's really good to see you. It's been a long time. Um, uh, she talks about uh, higher law um, in her presentation. Uh, and I think it, that's an important concept, uh, both in, I, I presume, uh, Maori law, but also in uh, New Zealand constitutional law. Um, I wonder what her what her perspective is with respect to uh, constitutional law, treaty law, international law, and indigenous law, and how all these laws, uh, fundamental laws, interact and interrelate. Well done, Romeo. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so I guess um, starting with uh, tikanga Māori, which is our, uh, our own legal system, and you're absolutely right, um, the higher law concept, I might, that might not be quite the right term, I guess, but um, certainly this idea of uh, higher principles that come from our atua, our ancestors and, and um, our gods, for want of a better word, the spiritual realm uh, that is that is our higher law um, and with principles you know there, well there are a number of leading principles but relating to uh, relationships between people between balance and, and so on which is dictates then how uh, particular laws might play out on the ground what you can do what you can't do what you should be doing when you're fishing and so on um, so there's very very much a concept of higher law um, within our own system um, thinking about the state legal system, I think higher law, at least in the Anglo tradition, as you are well aware, or the um, European issue, the Western, if you like, I don't know what the right word is, the Western legal tradition is there, but it seems to me at least um, to be sort of which law trumps, so having a constitutional law that might trump any other law from, say, the legislature or the judiciary, although there's interpretations that those other bodies might take. Um, and then obviously you're referring then to international law and its role there. How these legal systems inter interact or, inter or relate, I think um, with difficulty might be um, how I would describe it because um, fundamentally in the indigenous, um, or at least our, the, the Māori and, and Polynesian legal systems are fundamentally so philosophically a opposed. So where law comes from is, is not from one authority um, elected, or it's, it comes from the world around us, including our spirits and so on. Um, and, and I think international law, I would still put in the category of being basically a Western legal system of some description. I still think it's largely in construct um, a European framework. Um, I think that's changing as more states from around the world have, have, have influenced international law but I think it's genesis for, you know, in the 1500s, 16 going forward, it still is fundamentally European. And again, that's a tension with indigenous legal systems. What I do see, um, I guess, some really important um, movements happening uh, around trying to um, have these two legal systems or kinds of legal systems respect each other. Um, I think it's most important for the state legal system to recognize that there are individual independent um, indigenous legal systems and maybe they sit alongside, maybe one doesn't trump the other. In fact, one shouldn't necessarily trump the other, but you do need to negotiate between the legal systems as to how they're going to function together in a sort of pluralistic framework. But there's certainly state law should not determine what happens in um, te Māori. Where the declaration sits in there is that um, it can I think it can provide some guidance with how legal systems should work. It certainly gives emphasis to Indigenous legal systems and requires recognition of those systems as equal systems, not, with, not under state law, or at least you can interpret it that way. Um, and I can see that happening or being reflected in, for example, we've had a case recently that Tikanga Māori, our Māori law became part of the question. And the judge actually said, look, I'm going to decide this case with the evidence that's given to me about the tikanga experts and so on. 
But actually what I say about what tikanga means has got nothing to do with tikanga Māori. That's for, for people who are expert in tikanga Māori to determine. So, you know, I've got this dispute before me. I've been asked to, just, asked to address it. It was between two Māori parties. I'm replying tikanga Māori to the best I can. But, yeah, I thought it was awesome. And drawing on not explicitly the declaration, but that, that thinking behind the declaration to say, well, yeah, but it's like what I determine doesn't determine what tikanga is. I'm just... So, you know, those interactions between the systems, there's a lot more going on, at least in my part of the world, um, and um, the declaration broadly and providing equality between those systems is important. I talk too much, I'm sorry, um, I'm not sure if I've, I've even answered your question properly, Romeo, but I think those issues are important, and thank you. Thank you. Um... So we are out of time, and at the end of this roundtable, I want to thank our speakers for their very insightful and uh, rich presentations. I think this was a remarkable panel, both in terms of the presentation and the conversation, but also uh, in terms of the inspirational speakers it included. I think you all demonstrate the brilliance of our peoples, and this is clearly fitting for the, fitting for the theme of this 10th Annual Indigenous Awareness Week, which is uh, to celebrate Indigenous excellence and resilience. Uh, the presentation and conversations have been enlightening, and I'm sure the, the audience enjoyed hearing from you as much as I did. So, Tia Wenk, to each one of you. I would now invite Elder Geraldine to close our event. Oh, I got the not to go winning her で、で、日本語で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で